Tax Policy Center, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you here this morning for an important discussion of policy tools that can be used to fight poverty. The Economic Security Project has been reimagining existing policy tools in an effort to improve the workings of our economy and to restore a sense of fairness to, uh, to America. Today's conversation is going to look at existing sets of individual income tax credits, the primarily the the earned income tax credit and uh, child tax credit, and how they can be modified to promote work, both paid work and non-market work, and help address poverty and growing inequalities. We have an all-star array of speakers today, including elected officials, researchers, people directly involved in driving social change, and so I'm sure we'll learn a lot today. This is the fourth event that Tax Policy Centers had in this new uh, conference facility at the Urban Institute. Um, we're still learning how best to present material here and what works well, so please give us your feedback on what you like about this and, and also what we could do better. I also want to welcome our online audience as well as the audience here in person. We value your attention and we encourage you to participate in the discussion via social media using the hashtag live at urban. We're hoping for a vibrant discussion today both in person and online. Um, for the logistics of today's event, our plans to have two elected officials who are champions of ensuring that everyone in America gets a fair shake, and they're going to bookend a panel discussion of a specific tax proposal, the cost of living refund. We plan to leave plenty of time for questions, so those in the audience who have questions should be prepared to request a microphone from the uh, people who are roving around carrying microphones and then ask away at the appropriate time. And now it's my pleasure to introduce um, a, really a champion of working Americans, uh, Senator Sherrod Brown from Ohio. Senator Brown. Hey, folks, it's so quiet in this room. Jeez, wow. I know it's early and you don't get up. I, I don't even really even quite know. I guess this is a new building, Amy tells me. I don't quite know where exactly we are, and it's above the interstate and near the spy museum. And that's cool. So thank you. Thank, thanks for all that. Thanks for all that you do with the Economic Security Project. Uh, thanks for the activists in this room, the Urban Institute, Brookings Tax Policy Center. Uh, thanks for the groups that support a tax policy that puts people's that puts people first, like Moms Rising and the Center on Budget and Center for American Progress. So thanks to all of you. Um, this is um, this is my real voice. I'm not sick. I don't smoke. I just talk this way. And um, there's a story about this. My my wife and I were in an event a few a uh, couple a few years ago, and it was in a room about this size. But everybody was standing, no tables and chairs. And this guy's standing right next to my wife, whom she had never seen before. And as I start talking in the front of the room, he says to her, he said, "I hate that guy's voice." She said, "Yeah." And he said, "Yeah." When that guy speaks, man, it's like it's like fingernails on a blackboard. And Connie says, really? And Connie says, you know when I, you know, she said, I like his voice. He said, you like that guy's voice? And she said, yeah, you know when I really like it? And she leans, he leans in and she leans in and said, I really like it when he wakes me up in the middle of the night and says, I love you, baby. <laughs> so, um, let me, this is a group I know that, that, that cares about tax policy, cares about cost of living, cares about working families. And I want to talk uh, substantially and in some detail, because I know that's what you asked me to come do. Um, about all of these issues that matter so much to us. Uh, first of all, people too often act like Democrats have to choose between exciting our base by fighting for progressive values or choose between that and choosing to talk to workers about working family issues, uh, promoting an economic agenda with broad appeal. It's a false choice. Too often the media puts people in one category or another. It's not, it's not either or, it's both. Progressive economic ideas do have broad appeal. The dignity of work is a value that unites all of us. Ohio showed the country in 2018 that an outspoken progressive can win in a state that Trump won by almost 10 points by never by talking about work, by talking about economic issues, but never compromising on guns, never compromising on choice, never compromising on LGBT rights, never talk, compromising on voting rights and civil rights and climate change. Uh, you can you can go to Zanesville, a small industrial city on the edge of Appalachia in Ohio, a city where Democrats used to do pretty well and don't do very well now. Uh, I get votes there, because, even though people may disagree with my F from the NRA, or they may 
they may disagree with me because I'm pro-choice and opposed to the Hyde Amendment, but a number of them, I don't say I win there, but a number of them vote for me because of our focus on economic issues on the dignity of work. Uh, Trump, Trump likes to brag about the economy, but we know the unemployment rate in the stock market don't tell the whole story. Families don't measure their lives in quarterly earnings reports. We win people over with an economic message that speaks to the reality of their lives. Dignity of work means hard work should pay off for everyone, no matter who you are, what kind of work you do, no matter your race, no matter your gender, no matter your by and large economic status, whether you punch a clock or swipe a badge, whether you care for an aging parent, whether you're raising children, whether you work for tips, whether you work on a salary. Dignity of work is a message that speaks to, every, speaks to everyone. It's not, a, it's not just a campaign slogan. It may be that, and it should be that, and I think that's how we win the White House. It's not just a campaign slogan, though. It's, it's who we are. It's what we stand for. It's how come 2021, it's how come 2021 we govern. When work has dignity, workers are paid a living wage. Uh, it's, it's, so it's, but it's not just about wages. It's about benefits. It's about health insurance. It's about a secure retirement. Um, it's about uh, work schedule. Far too many people that don't have a union have a work schedule that simply doesn't work for their lives as they get moved around and jacked around and all that happens. It's about child care. I was in Laconia, New Hampshire three months ago and a woman who's worked in child care for decades said to me, child care should be a public good. The way that we fund parks and the way we fund public education, we should think about child care the same way. And you think about it this way. So many American families can't afford child care. And on the other end, the people that work in child care don't make a living wage so often. So clearly there is a, there is a fundamental role that, that, that our economic system, our capitalist system doesn't work for child care. There, there is a role for government when we talk about that. And we can't, we can't accomplish any of these things, whether it's wages or benefits, uh, whether it's a minimum wage bill and an, or an over, uh, fixing the overtime rule that, that, that Secretary Perez fixed five years ago. We can't accomplish any of this without a tax code that puts people first. When people filed their taxes this year, they began to see President Trump and congressional Republicans um, tax scam for what it really was. It was a handout to billionaires at the expense of working families. It's part of the president's phony populism. He divides America to distract from the fact that they admit that the White House looks like a retreat for Wall Street executives, except, in the day, except for the days it looks like a retreat for the gun lobby executives, or except for the days it looks like a retreat for drug company executives. It's part of, it's, it's, it, it, it Understanding his, when you look at his phony populism, true populism is, ne true populism is never racist, it's never anti-Semitic, it never divides people, it never pushes some people down to lift other people up. Populists don't pass tax cuts for rich people and starve Head Start and starve public education and starve public health. We fight back with a real true, a true populism, a real populism, a tax vision that invests in workers and families. And let me tell you what that looks like. First of all, it looks like the Patriot Corporation Act. The Patriot Corporation Act simply says if you pay decent wages and you provide decent benefits and you do your production, in the United States of America, you get a lower tax rate. On the other hand, if a huge number of your employees uh, make under twelve dollars, uh, make under twelve dollars an hour, or don't have, or, or re, de, just uh, depend on the government for Medicaid or food stamps, or depend on the government for Section Eight housing, then those companies pay a corporate freeloader fee. So it's it's a carrot for Patriot corporations. It's a stick for companies. Um, that freeload off of taxpayers. Second, we know that people need help with keeping up with the cost of living. Uh, productivity is up. Corporate, corporate executive compensation has skyrocketed. Corporate profits have soared, yet stock buybacks are at record levels, but wages fundamentally for the last several years have been flat. The cost of everything is up, health care is up, child care is up, college is up, particularly prescription drug costs are up. As you know, one in four renters spends more than half their income on housing. That's why I'm rolling out a, a, a renter's tax credit this summer. The number one tool we have to keep Americans, to help Americans keep up with these expenses is expanding the earned income tax credit and the child tax credit. These are the two most effective ways to get put money into the pockets of the American people. There are a number of bills to get us there, a number of ways we can get there, but the most important accomplishment is we have virtually every single Democrat united behind this vision.
We have 46 co-sponsors in one of our Senate bills. Congressman Kildee from Michigan just introduced the House version last week, and he will have lots of sponsors soon. Uh, we, we, we're all united around a couple of goals. We need to make sure that every child gets the full credit regardless of what their parents do. President Trump and his tax cut for billionaires and Republicans in Congress left out 26 million children in their child tax credit provisions, including half of all black and Hispanic kids and 42% of children living in rural areas. Having a family should obviously not be a luxury only for rich people. At the same time, we need to make sure that workers without children share in the earned income tax credit. They shouldn't be taxed into poverty as some people are if they're right on the edge, they don't have children, they pay the payroll tax, they get very little or no, no earned income tax credit. We should allow everyone to get an advance on their EITC payment once a year. So if their car breaks down and they need $400, they, they, don't, they don't have to go to a shady, pay, pay, a shady payday lender. When we unite behind a common purpose and fight for the people we serve, it's what we're able to do in, in um, 2013, 2014, and 2015. Go back, go back five years ago and, and look what happened. Republicans wanted to push through a bunch of tax cuts for corporations. They had the House, they had the Senate. Uh, President Obama was in the White House. With the help of Nancy Pelosi and many of you in this room, we united Democrats, started off with just a few sponsors, and we grew and grew and grew and grew. Um, we got we got ultimately every Democrat on board, and we all moved went under the assumption and the stated purpose of no tax cuts for corporations without tax cuts for working families. We demanded they make President Obama's expansion of EITC and the child tax credit permanent. And then what finally got us there, as we all stood in the same place, was President Obama. We got President Obama to issue a veto threat against the Republican bill. It took three years. We got it done with a Republican House and a Republican Senate. It gave millions of Americans a foothold to begin to get to move into the middle class. We didn't do it by moving to the middle. We didn't do it by moderating our goals. We didn't do it by watering down our legislation. We did it by uniting behind a common purpose, by saying this is who we are, this is whom we fight for, this is what we stand for, and we don't back down. In working together, we do that again. Understanding Republican Senate, obviously, Republican White House, all in the tank with special interests every single time. But that's why your work is so important over the next couple of months in, in turning this tax bill, again, all, almost every Democrat's on board this tax bill. Um, it's something we, even though the odds look long to observers that don't really look at what happened four years ago, um, the odds are not that long in making this happen. Uh, Dr. King once said progress never rolls in on the wheels of inevitability. Progress never rolls in on the wheels of inevitability. It rolls in because people in this room never give up on fighting for workers and families. Because if you love this country, you fight for the people who make it work. Thanks so much. A simple tire, a flat tire, can result in somebody becoming homeless. And that sounds crazy, but it's true. My hours could, you know, probably 45, 50 hours. It all depends on the week. It's very stressful, you know, having three children and having to work all these extra hours. But then if I stay home, I lose my apartment. I can't put food on the table. So I just have to keep it going. To have worked so hard to get to a point and then you still feel like you're just spinning your wheels. Um, never really made quite enough to pay the bills. You know, something goes wrong with the car or something, you know, unexpected, an unexpected payment or fee comes along. You know, that's a crisis.
Hi, everyone. It's so nice to be here with all of you. My name is Eileen Anzalotti. I'm an assistant editor at Fast Company, and I'm going to just really briefly introduce all of our panelists. You should have their full bios um, in the information packet, so we'll just do names for now. But um, here is Elaine Mogg, and she is the principal research associate at the Urban Brookings Tax Policy Center. Um, as you might have heard by now, we were supposed to have Chris Hughes, the um, co-chair of the Economic Security Project, here with us on this panel, but he's having some travel woes. So in his place is Adam Rubin, the campaigns director at the Economic Security Project. Um, we have Aparna Mather, who's the resident scholar in economic policy studies at American Enterprise Institute, and Aisha Niandoro, the chief executive officer of Springboard to Opportunities. Um, so we are here, you know, as you just heard Senator Brown talk about, to discuss a really important issue in this country. Right now, our economy is a story of extremes. On the one end, there's a tiny sliver of people at the top who, as it's been recently reported, have more financial resources than they know what to do with. And, but for everybody else who is not in that group, it's becoming increasingly difficult to get by in this country. And it's not because people are not working hard enough. Um, there was a recent study that came out that a third of Americans who earn an income feel that they need to take on additional work in order to meet basic necessities, like paying rent, buying food, everything like that. And there's, you know, as we just saw in this video too, there's the fact that for so many people in the country, a single, you know, $400 emergency is enough to, to send them into debt. And this is a massive problem that we're here to talk about today, focusing specifically on a policy proposal that could correct some of these problems. So um, we're really excited to have all of the panelists here. And um, we're just going to dive into a discussion about um, one specific policy that the Economic Security Project is working um, to advance. And then we're going to open it up to questions. So make sure you're thinking about things you want to ask, and then I will try to get to everyone who has a question at the end. Um, but to start off with, I would love to, to ask Elaine maybe to kick things off with, you know, why is it important to be thinking in this moment about expanding the earned income tax credit? So we've reached this kind of interesting point where we are just inundated with information about the forgotten Americans, as Bell Saul Hill would say, or people who are working hard and feel like they're not getting ahead, like in The Voice. And what we're hearing is it's not just one issue. So it's not a housing problem. It's not a child care problem. It's not a transportation problem. It's all of these things put together. And so we have the, we're at this point where you can either build on this Rube Goldberg machine of sort of tax and transfer policies we have, or you can try to and add more pieces. Or you can find something that we already have that is successful and build on that. And so I think there's a lot of talk right now of looking at the earned income tax credit, which has been quite successful at lifting people, some people, out of poverty and seeing, can we make that program work better? And so I did work with Aaron Huffer and Donald Marin, where we sort of took apart the EITC, just every piece of it. So why does it matter how you phase the credit in? If you phase it in quickly, people with very low incomes get it. Why does that credit maximum matter? Well, that's really related to how much the whole proposal is going to cost. And how do you think about getting rid of benefits, or do you? Do you continue benefits forever, or do you phase them out? And so what we wanted to do is say all of these choices involve trade-offs, and those are the debates we should be having today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wonderful. And um, so, Aparna, I wanted to turn it over to you, because. Um, you know, Elaine, you kind of mentioned the issue of cost and everything like that. So what are some of the, the concerns that have been brought up around the cost of such a program? And, and what are some um, considerations that need to be kept in mind when we think about how to structure an expansion? Yeah, great. I mean, I agree with, you know, a lot of what Elaine said. Uh, we know that the EITC is sort of been the most successful anti-poverty program. And it's worked not only, I think, because of the direct cash transfers that people get, you know, because it's a refundable tax credit, you get the money even if you don't have a tax liability, but it actually is a pro-work policy. And I think that's been sort of the one thing that's gotten the left and the right to, to agree that the EITC is sort of this most successful, you know, federal anti-poverty program, because not only is it giving, uh, you know, poor families cash, 
but it's also keeping that attachment to work because it's tied to work. So for every dollar that you get, you know, you 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 get a certain amount of money back from from the federal government at the end of the year. Um, I, I think uh, you know, as um, Elaine mentioned, there are of course trade-offs to having these policies, and unfortunately, you know, expanding the EITC can prove to be pretty costly. Um, uh, yeah, so there are three facets to the EITC. You know, the trajectory of what it looks like is that there is a phase-in rate, and then there's a maximum credit, and then you phase out. And you know, we've been doing some calculations as well uh, at AEI, sort of looking at well, what happens if you phase it in at a faster rate? What happens if you expand the EITC for childless adults or you know, non-custodial parents who are sort of the lowest beneficiaries of the EITC? And these programs can become very costly very quickly. So, so currently, the EITC costs about $70 billion a year. Uh, you know, I was looking at some other uh, proposals, like the, uh, you know, the CLR proposal, the cost of living refund proposal that Elaine is mentioning. Uh, you, know, you estimate it would cost about $2.5 trillion over 10 years. Um, you know, the GAIN Act, the, the LIFT uh, Act, all of them are, we're looking at about $270 billion a year or more. Uh, so, so I think you know, we, we have to worry not just about, yes, there is a benefit, uh, what is, how do we actually fund it? You know, what do we do away with? Because it will come at the cost of something else. So, so I think you know, just sort of looking at, and, and it's not as if other options don't exist. You know, I've talked about doing a carbon tax and using some of the revenues to expand the EITC. You know, Len in his paper on the universal EITC, which would basically you know, never phase out, everybody gets the EITC, uh, you know, talks about doing a value added tax and funding it, funding the expanded EITC through uh, an 11% VAT. So, so there are, you know, options exist, uh, but we have to be mindful of the trade-offs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And before we kind of dive a little bit more into the specifics of the cost of living program, those options, um, I wanted to turn it to Aisha to talk a little bit about the importance of um, giving people cash and what cash does to, to help correct some of these problems. So she's going to talk about the program she's overseeing and just that, the impact that we need to be keeping in mind. Yeah, no, thank you for that question. And so I think, you know, quite simply, cash provides the dignity to solve the problems in your own life. It gives individuals that agency. Vouchers, subsidies, social service programs do not provide that. And I am someone who runs an entity that provides social service programs. And I recognize the flaw in that system. And so each day there are opportunities for us to witness the power of cash if we're really looking for them. Perfect example, this morning my flight was delayed. So um, I was coming in out of New York. My flight was delayed, so I just went and got a hotel. This morning as I was coming in, I saw all the individuals that had to spend a night at the airport. Cash for me solved that problem. Just like the women in the video who talked about, you know, an emergency can end, make you end up in homelessness. That's actually reality, that's not rhetoric. And so, yes, there are policy trade-offs when we talk about how do we go about implementing these large systematic changes. But what we're doing is not working. That's the reality. Individuals should not be working 40, 50 hours a week and still have to live with the stress of knowing that if an emergency happens, they do not have the resources necessary to take care of that. So it's about you know, figuring out how do we center families and individuals in those conversations and then begin to make the policy shifts. For us with the organization that I run, um, to mention just our pilot that we're doing, we're really beginning to look at what happens when you center families and give them cash. We have a small pilot that we're running out of Mississippi called the Magnolia Mothers Trust, where we are giving 20 low-income, single African-American mothers $1,000 a month for 12 months, trusting them to do what it is that their families need with those resources, no strings attached. We're saying we see you, we hear you, we are not going to put additional barriers in place, we are not going to give you another program, we're going to give you the resources to show up with dignity and agency. And our moms are doing amazing, and it's because they understand better than anyone what these resources mean for their lives, and they understand more than anyone that it really is a time-limited situation. So they are showing up like superwomen. Every day we have folks who are paid off, have paid off significant debt, and not debt that was any 
um, quote unquote, them being mis irresponsible, it was debt that they've gotten into because when you are poor, there are systems in place that continuously take advantage of you. So we have women who had debt uh, from pe predatory lenders. We had women who had debt from predatory community colleges. So these folks have paid off that debt and have re-enrolled in school. We had a mom who was, for the first time, able to take off work and be sick. And so cash allows you just to show up and live your full life. And so I'll stop there. I mean, that yeah, it's, it's so powerful. So um, Adam, I know that at the Economic Security Project, you've been you know supporting programs like Magnolia Mother's Trust. And you know that's more of a basic income approach. And we're obviously here to talk about um, an expansion of the EITC. Can you, so can you talk a little bit about um, the just how those two ideas kind of work toward the same aims, but um, through slightly different mechanisms? Yeah. Um, first of all, I apologize for not being Chris Hughes. Um, I thought about trying to just pull it off and tell you some stories about when I was Mark Zuckerberg's roommate in college, but I just didn't think I could sustain it for the whole panel. Um, yeah, at Economic Security Project, we really started uh, a couple of years ago by thinking about how do we build an economy that works for more people? And in particular, how do we use cash as a solution? Mm -hmm. How do we put more money back in low and middle income people's pockets? Um, and we came to understand through our exploration that we really think of a universal basic income as a set of values um, about freedom and dignity and giving people agency over their own lives, about giving people a sense of economic security, both the folks who are in poverty who are just struggling to make ends meet day to day and the people who are doing just a little bit better who say, I'm okay today, but I'm you know, one car accident or broken leg away from financial disaster. Um, and we came to understand the power of using the tax code as a tool to help people, one of the, most, like, one of the biggest levers um, that we have to take an existing program like the EITC, which is so successful and so well documented in terms of its impact, not only at lifting people out of poverty, but also improving their health, improving their access to education, improving the employment prospects of their children, but that also leaves so many people behind today. And in partnership with Tax Policy Center and other organizations like ITEP, who's here, um, to look at how could you modernize it and expand it for the way that work has changed and the people who are still left behind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. And then um, can you describe to, while we're kind of on the subject, a little bit more um, in detail what the specific cost of living refund policy is that, that you're working on? Yeah. Um, first of all, I think it's helpful to say that the term cost of living refund we think of as an umbrella in the way that Medicare for All is an umbrella that expresses a set of a goal and a set of values and intentions. But there are a bunch of different policy details underneath that, and they differ, different bills differ in the exact parameters, but they're all marching in the same direction. And so we think of a cost of living refund um, the same way. Um, there are a bunch of different proposals. I'm gonna tell you about the one that we worked out with um, the advice of the Tax Policy Center but Kamala Harris's is a little bit different in some perspectives. Sherrod Brown's is a little different in some perspectives. Cory Booker's, but they're all kind of marching in the same direction. Um, we take the Earn Income Tax Credit and modernize it and expand it in three key ways. Um, the first is more money for more people. Um, the EITC is great, but it's, it just needs to simply be bigger. So it needs to um, have, it needs to go further up the income spectrum to help the people who are living on the brink today as well as those who are struggling in poverty um, to help people who are struggling in the lower middle class. And it needs to have a larger credit because a lot of people get 100 or 200 bucks a year from the EITC today, which is good, but it's not enough to really make as big a difference in their lives as we need to make. Um, we need to expand the eligibility. Right now, the EITC, you're only eligible if you're a worker between the ages of 25 and 64. But as you well know, there are people under 25 who are working to make ends meet and people over 65 who are doing that. So we expand um, the age range of folks who are eligible. And as Senator Brown and others have talked about, um, dramatically expanding the credit for people who don't have children in the home is an important priority that a lot of people have agreed on. So that's the first thing is more money for more people, expand out the eligibility. The second one is to expand the definition of work. The EITC has always been grounded in work, the idea that if you, you have to work for what you get um, and that we should kind of reward it and make work pay. Um, and there's a lot of broad public support for that idea. 
Um, but we found in our opinion research, we'd ask people, what does that mean to work for what you get? Is that only a paid job in the formal economy? And mostly we heard people say, no, it means you're giving something back. You're doing something for your family, your community, to better yourself in some way. Um, and so we expand the definition of work. You still have to work for your EITC, but we can expand the definition to include other things that people are doing that have value. Um, we start with family caregiving. If you're home with a young child or a sick parent or a disabled relative, and so you can't work, but you're caring for somebody else, that is work. That is an incredibly valuable activity in our society that we don't treat as a thing of value today. Of course, care is provided mostly by women and more heavily by women of color, so there are important equity implications. We say that's work. You should qualify. We should reward that as well and make you eligible for the cost of living refund. Um, similarly, if you're in school, low-income student putting yourself through school, maybe you've got Pell Grants to help you with your tuition, but what about your living expenses? Mm -hmm. That's why you see so many students living in their cars at some point in their college career, particularly in community colleges, so you should be eligible as well. Um, so we expand the definition of work to include family caregivers and low-income students. And then the third key modernization is to make the credit uh, more user-friendly and accessible. Um, right now, most people go, the pattern uh, with a lot of EITC recipients is you get deeper and deeper into debt over the course of the year, and then you dig back out of the hole at tax time. Um, as Senator Brown said, you, you, your car breaks and you end up with a shady payday lender. Um, so we want to give people the option to get the credit on a monthly basis. So it's just coming steadily, a regular drumbeat throughout the year. If you're one of the folks who's in poverty, that's really helping you stretch your budget till the end of the month. And if you're doing just a little bit better, that's a way to save something and build a financial cushion for the 40% of Americans who don't have savings for a $400 emergency. Um, we also want to make it easier for people to get so that everyone who is eligible actually gets access to that credit. Um, we, are, uh, we see that one out of five people today who are eligible um, it's because it's an onerous process to file. It can be an expensive process for a lot of people to file. They don't actually get the money. And so we want to make that an automatic process. The IRS knows what you made. They have your W-2s and your 1099s, and they should reach out to you and say, this is what we think you made. Verify this is right. Sign this form and send it back, um, and we'll send you your, your EITC. So altogether, um, Elaine's research finds that that would benefit nearly half of all Americans, 154 million Americans who would uh, benefit from the cost of living refund. Um, it would lift about 14 million people out of poverty, cutting poverty by a third, um, about two and a half times the poverty reduction impact of the current EITC, which is already our best anti-poverty program. So um, a really significant um, modernization that can make a big difference in the lives of half the folks in this country. I mean, I, I think that makes it pretty clear that this would have an incredible impact on you know, people's individual lives and the economy overall. So I'm wondering, um, before, we, there's obviously a lot to unpack there, but um, before we get into that, I'm curious, and I want to open this up to all of you, what might um, kind of imagining a future where this has been Im um, implemented, what might what changes might we see to the economy? Like, how might this help the country overall? So I want to um, actually step back on the administration point just a minute. Um, so it is cumbersome and difficult to get the EITC. It's confusing. But compared to transfer programs, it can be a walk in the park. Mm -hmm. So that's a reason why um, we think about the tax system as a good place to subsidize people. So for the most part, people are already filing tax returns. A lot of that information is available, and the administrative costs are low. So just because we want, um, there might be some goals to make it simpler, it is a lot easier to fill out a tax return than to show up at a welfare office from mm -hmm. 8 to 4 when you're supposed to be working to document, um, you know, provide documentation that might be necessary. Um, so all of those things kind of argue for a tax-based approach, too. As far as what would happen if we implemented a broad expansion. So at the Urban Institute, we've been doing work on big policies and small policies and trying to figure out what they mean. So I did some work with um, Kevin Warner and Laura Wheaton, where we just said, expand the childless EITC somewhat modestly, so triple it, $1,500 instead of $500. And we think the research out there shows, based on some state things that have happened, that 
we could have non-custodial parents um, paying more on their child support orders. So this has a benefit to children who will see those resources in their homes. Um, we also think it will help um, encourage people to move into the labor market. So that's sort of the goal um, in some places for um, folks who are disenfranchised from work now. Um, maybe working in the underground economy instead of the above, uh, above ground economy. We give them a little bit of a, a nudge into the workforce. So now we have um, people who, you know, the best protection against poverty is having, you know, a job. And so we encourage more people to work. So those are sort of the, chi uh, the childless EITC focused programs. We think then if we went on the other scale is sort of where ESP is at, where they're saying, let's spend two and a half trillion dollars. Let's make this um, EITC a little bit simpler, not based it on kids, based it on whether you're married or single. We think that um, could again push people into the labor market somewhat, although we have a tight labor market. Um, there's still some people left out. We also think that evidence is pretty good out there that some of the benefits that Adam was mentioning will happen. So when we put cash in people's pockets, moms go buy food for their kids. When we put um, cash in people's pockets, people get the health care they need. You can watch, um, there was some interesting research out of the Fed where they watch people get their EITCs and then they look at credit card statements. How are people using it? And we see um, these sort of ripple effects through the economy. So people are going to the grocery store. People are getting dental care that's been pushed off. People are paying down debt. So those kind of things help make people more um, stable. But I'll turn it over. I know other people have thoughts. But yeah. oh, great. <clears throat> I mean, I, 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 I think there's a lot to like about the cost of living refund proposal. You know, it addresses a lot of what we see as potential, you know, reforms to the EITC. One, yeah, we, you know, we want a massive expansion of the EITC. We know it's a pro-work, pro-family policy. There are lots of good impacts on families of families getting the EITC. I think that's great. Uh, you know, expanding the EITC for childless workers or non-custodial uh, parents is, is a great idea. And I think improving the frequency of payment receipts is also uh, is also a step in the right direction. Um, uh, again, uh, you know, the, the one thing to worry about is, again, the cost, the cost side of it. You know, what happens when you have this massive expansion in the EITC? How are we funding it? You know, what other trade-offs are we making? Um, uh, and I think, secondly, uh, you know, my, uh, you know, we, we tend to view the EITC as solving a lot of problems uh, across the country. You know, we, everybody sort of jumps to the EITC when we, want to, to solve, oh, you know, people have low incomes, how do we solve that? Will we do the EITC? People are not, uh, you know, working or not getting jobs with decent pay, you know, how do we solve that to get the EITC? I think it's also important to recognize that when we're talking about poverty as a whole, there are people out there who are not working. And the fact that the EITC is so closely tied to work, you know, mm -hmm. tends to leave out a lot of the non-working poor. And the CLR, you know, the, the cost of living refund gets at some of that. You know, it gets at the caregivers who are out of the labor market. You know, I've, uh, I'm deeply care about the issue of caregiving. You know, I direct the um, A.I. Brookings Paid Family Leave Project where, you know, we constantly worry about, well, how do we make leave paid? How do we make sure that people who want to take time off work for caregiving are able to do that? I think the EITC can fill some of that hole. But at the same time, you know, you actually need uh, some dedicated program that lets you take that leave, that lets you feel comfortable taking that time off. Um, uh, so, so I think, you know, that's a step in the right direction, but also to recognize that there are a lot of people who are not working. And how do we, you know, how do we meet that challenge? Mm -hmm. uh, so when you look at, you know, poverty as a whole, we, we have sort of 7 million people, I think is the latest estimate of people who are not in the labor force for a variety of reasons that we don't, often understand, you know, it could be mental, uh, you know, health issues, it could be disability, it could be, uh, you know, they, they don't have the right skills, they don't have the right training, they, do, they didn't get the right education when they were in school, they didn't have access to the good schools. And, and I think a lot of that, uh, you know, will require a ton of different types of policies. It could be, you know, paid apprenticeship programs for younger workers, it could be, um, uh, you know, relocation vouchers or, or people, the, just letting people travel to where the jobs are, figuring out, you know, how do we match people better with jobs. So, 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 so not to say that this is not a great idea, but I think we need sort of a broader package of reforms if we really want to address the, you know, sort of the holistic issue of poverty. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, um, Aisha, I was wondering if you might want to expand on that a little bit too, because the program that you're currently overseeing is, you know, very much this idea of no strings attached support. So, do you think that the benefits that you're seeing the mothers you're working with, you know, um, be able to attain through the program would be, um, you know, do you think they would get the same benefits through this expansion? Hmm. So, yes, but. <laughs> easy answer. You know, I think so, yes, um, because at the end of the day, it really is about those additional resources without the additional strings or penalties or the due diligence of, of having to report to the welfare offices and those different things. So, of course, I think that it still would get to the same outcome, but I think in order for it to really be successful with my population, it would, you know, have to go back to some of the pieces that Adam was saying with broadening the definition of work and recognizing that if you are staying at home, caring for your child or, or caring for your parent, that is work. And in a lot of instances that is celebrated um, when it's not a low income household, when we're talking about that. So if a white middle class woman decides to stay home and raise her child, that's applauded. If a low income black woman decides to do the same thing, it is, oh my God, what is she doing? She should go get a job. So we have got to begin to change our narrative and you know, look at some of those challenges. So to answer the question, of course, I think it would have some of the same benefits with some of the finesses um, and tweaks that and expansions that we've talked about. But I also want to talk, you know, just a little more broadly about the impact to the economy when we're talking about eradicating poverty. Yes, there is immediate impact to the economy right now when we get that we could see if you give individuals resources. But thinking about the ripple effect of that and the long-term impact for those kids, that my mom now has the bandwidth to show up and go to a PTA meeting, or my father now has the bandwidth to show up and go to um, a city council meeting or whatever that looks like. So what that does to a child when they're able to see their parents show up differently in their lives, that's impactful. And it has an effect that we can't measure in dollar and cents right now. And so, yeah. Let me just put a couple of numbers out that I think help to see what the difference is. Um, a couple of the, like just to give you examples of a couple of different people and what this policy would do for them. Um, imagine you're a McDonald's worker. I spent several years working as a leader on the Fight for 15, the minimum wage campaign. And so we worked a lot with fast food workers who were um, really struggling. If you're working at a wage of about $10 an hour full time, um, so you're making about $20,000 a year, um, you earn too much if you don't have children. You earn too much to qualify for the EITC today. Under this policy, our cost of living refund, you'd get $4,000 a year. Um, if you're earning less, because most people don't get full-time hours um, working in fast food, if you're making $10,000 a year, you get about $400 from the EITC today. You get 10 times that under a cost of living refund. Um, if you're a couple with two kids earning $45,000, you get about $1,362 from the EITC today, but $8,000 under the cost of living refund. So a much more dramatic impact um, on people's lives, providing them with economic security. And if you're home with a sick parent and you're not earning income outside the home, you get nothing today. Um, but you would get um, the full credit, $4,000 if you're a single person or $8,000 if you're married. Um, from the cost of living refund. So we see sort of going back to where Aisha started, cash giving people the tools um, and the dignity to solve their own problems. It's boosting people out of poverty and creating a foundation of economic security. It goes hand in hand with raising the minimum wage. I think like we need $15 an hour too, um, but also $15 an hour, let's be honest, is tough to raise a family in a city, any city in America on $15 an hour. So we need these kinds of supports um, as well. Um, and that will also help us reduce rising inequality and promote racial equity because it's mostly people of color who are more heavily concentrated in the bottom half of the income spectrum and who the analysis has found would benefit disproportionately from this policy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and I think you raise a really good point, too, about the need to consider some other tactics that are out there to reduce poverty. One of them is, you know, obviously raising the minimum wage. So, again, I want to open this up to everyone. Um, how might an expanded earn, earned income tax credit work with some of these other ideas for poverty alleviation? Right. I mean, you know, as, as I was uh, mentioning, I think you need to sort of have a broader policy package. You know, currently what 
people who are not working typically have access to TANF. Um, and, and food stamps. And I think food stamps have particularly been sort of a big, uh, you know, anti-poverty or at least have, have really been shown to help low-income households who are not actually tied to work or, or who don't have enough earnings to, to um, you know, even maybe get the EITC. So I think, you know, talking about, talking about that, but also sort of looking at, well, what is the problem that we're trying to solve? You know, if the problem is that people don't have the right skills or the right training. You know, the EITC can go so far, but I think we need to pair that with, with something that says, okay, we need to get this worker into a job or get them into an on-the-job training program. You know, how do we do that? If the problem is that people are, uh, you know, have disability issues or mental, you know, mental health issues, you know, what, what's the actual policy that would fix that? So, so I like the idea that you know the EITC sort of gives more money to to families directly and allows them to address some of that. But I think you also need to sort of look at more targeted programs and, and figure out well what is it that's going wrong in in those programs that's not actually helping sort of the non-working poor. Uh, so, so looking at it more broadly, I think makes a ton of sense. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a really interesting point, and I think it's probably worth noting sort of all these big legislative proposals that have come out, the people sponsoring them did start at different points. So in the American Family Act, there was the notion that there are very low income children, some with almost no income. They are in need of an absolute boost in income. And so there's no work requirement for the child tax credit piece of the American Family Act. And then on top of that, there's this pretty great research out there that says, if we get money to very young children, it has a lifetime of benefits, um, so they start off better, and it gives them a boost that carries through. And so that um, proposal also has an extra boost for families with children under six. When um, Con and Brown started their work on the EITC, there's an interesting New York Times article out there where it shows wages basically stagnated as the rest of the economy grew. And so they said, what would you have to do to pick up those, to get that growth the same so these bars are parallel? And they did it through the EITC. So they were very much focused only on workers, not on people who are out of the labor market. Um, when Senator Harris came out with her big lift act, she was very focused on middle class families are still struggling. And her story was that they have jobs, they're working, they're earning you know, kind of decent wages in some cases, and they're still having a hard time. And so she said, what can we do for that group of people? So she really focuses on the middle, middle class. And then you know, Senator Booker, when he comes and talks about the RISE Act, which is the um, CLR proposal that we analyzed, he's talking about there's some people who are totally left behind, and there's some people who are still struggling. And he's trying to balance by including some of these childless workers was a huge push for him. Um, so I think it absolutely you know, matters what problem are you trying to solve and whether the tax system is an appropriate tool to do that. And I think it is important to remember that some people are so disconnected um, from the labor market and formal systems that the EITC, even if we made it you know, fully refundable so everyone could get it, there's gonna be a communication issue trying to you know, actually get the resources to people. And then also for people who are very disconnected, you really have to be concerned about this delivery mechanism. So Adam talked about sort of advancing the payments so they're more contemporaneous with need. Well, that's a huge minefield. Um, a lot of these proposals come with it and we're gonna be talking about it and someone in this room is gonna be smart enough to figure it out. But that's a really important issue. So if you are just gonna increase benefits and allow people to get into all this debt throughout the year, you watch their finances decline, and then in March or April, you give them this EITC, it comes out, and it's like you're pulling people out of poverty, and then in a couple months, they're dropped right back down. You have to question, is that the best way to address these problems? And so I think particularly as we think about that credit getting larger, we really need to be thoughtful about do we deliver it in quarterly payments, in monthly payments, or is this annual payment the silver bullet that we've landed on? And just to add to that, I mean, I think you know it's fair to point out that there are issues with the current EITC in terms of erroneous payments. Now we, you know, we, we don't think of that as fraud. I think a lot of it is just people not figuring out, okay, where you know who's the eligible parent to get the EITC, you know, where who does the child actually reside with. I think a lot of that 
is done away with in the CLR proposal because mm -hmm. the payments are tied to individual earnings and not to, to the family or, or are not at least tied to children. But, right. but in the current EIT, EITC, I think, you know, reason why some people hesitate to even expand the EITC is the fact that we already have like 25% of the payments are, are estimated to be erroneously paid out. And also, on the other hand, a lot of people who should be eligible for the EITC are not claiming it because they just don't understand, you know, the rules or that they're even eligible for it. So I think, yeah, you know, they, we have to be cautious about the solution. The, it's, it's not going to be a ma magic bullet solution that we expand the EITC and everybody is suddenly a lot better off. I think we have to be careful to, to recognize that even the current EITC has limitations when we expand it and we try to do things like, oh, you know, now this is available to you monthly. Uh, you know, it could lead to a lot more, to some extent, more complexity, even though the aim is to actually ease the, yeah, you know, the lives of sort of the, yeah, the working poor. Mm -hmm. Just to take it up one level, I think we see all these big ideas coming out in the kind of ideas debate that's happening right now. And one way maybe to think about them is um, that a sort of a full vision of an economy that works for everyone has policies that address work, like a $15 mm -hmm. an hour minimum wage and job quality things over time and things like that. Wealth, both at the top end, like a wealth tax that's been proposed, um, and at the bottom end, like baby bonds proposals that are ways of building wealth in families and closing the racial wealth gap. Health, obviously one of the biggest drivers of economic challenges for people is medical and healthcare costs. Income, like the cost of living refund and structural power, things like anti-monopoly and other things that change the rules to benefit working people. And so that's why I think it's exciting to see so many of these ideas coming out here. You can't have, this is, we think this is a great solution, mm -hmm. but as Aparna and others are saying, it doesn't exist in isolation. We need a mm -hmm. comprehensive vision of how to build an economy that works for everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I want to expand on that a little bit more too, because you know you were kind of touching on the fact that this is trying to correct a lot of structural inequality in the US. And I can't help but think that also touches on issues like housing affordability and student debt and everything like that. So um, where do you see the EITC expansion fitting into that larger conversation around how do we provide for people at every stage of their life? And again, like anybody who wants to take this, feel free. So I think one of the big issues with the EITC today is that there are these people being left out. So 97% of benefits are going to families with children. So that's sort of leaving out these um, students and other people you're pointing out aren't getting benefits. And so if we extend the policy to cover more people, then people can use it on the items that are relevant in their lives. Um, so I think in some ways you can expand it and you don't have to worry about is your problem education, is your problem low wages, is your problem childcare, is it transportation? I mean, I think the only thing I would add is we, uh, you know, with the EITC as it is currently structured, you you do you do have these age limits on who can get the EITC, and the assumption is, okay, by age 25, you know, you're working, uh, you're eligible for the EITC. I think one of the ideas that I've been uh, noodling about is, what if, you know, a, a big sort of gap we're seeing currently in, in the labor market today is that that a lot of younger workers are not actually transitioning smoothly out of college and into work. And so what happens if people are, you know, dropping out before they actually reach the labor market? You know, we know that they're going to have sort of temporary jobs or part-time work or, you know, they're going to go on the welfare system and, and they're going to be continually struggling. But what if we had a, an EITC type idea that, that is really about getting people into the labor market? You know, what if we could help those younger workers make that transition easily? So that then you have, okay, you know, once you get your first job, you, you, you sort of have the likelihood that you, you will have a decent, stable career and have, you know, a, a decent paycheck. But if you don't get that first job because you drop out of college or you don't have the money to go to a good college and you, don't, you therefore don't get the first job, you know, I, I think sort of looking at, as, as you point out, uh, you know, looking at where can the EITC fit in in different parts of a person's life cycle? You know, wh why do we only sort of target the people who are a certain, you know, sort of the prime age workers or you know, even slightly older workers but who are still working? Why not look at the sort of the pre-work 
uh, you know, lives of these individuals. And I'm not saying, uh, you know, that's not UBI, that's not saying we just give them cash and let them figure out what they want to do with it. But if we have, you know, if we want to incentivize the right skills training, the right coursework, the right, you know, uh, on the job training, the right investments in education, you know, maybe something like, a, like an EITC type proposal, but that's not directly just tied to work, uh, you know, could, could, also, could also be part of the playbook. So, so that's something I'm, we're trying to think more about, you know, not, because the EITC is sort of very focused on people who have a job. Uh, and I know, you know, I appreciate the fact that you're trying to extend that, but I think we can go even further, um, you know, to, to just have policies that are pro-work or that get you into the labor market to begin with. Yeah, and um, so we're kind of uh, winding down a little bit on time for this panel discussion, but I wanted to wrap up um, by talking a little bit or asking you about, you know, we're heading toward the election next year, unbelievably, and um, where, where do you see the discussion around the EITC expansion landing with candidates? You know, you kind of mentioned a couple candidates that have made proposals that track with what we're talking about now, but how do you see that potentially evolving before the election, or, or what's the likelihood of this, you know, really becoming like a policy point during, you know, as we kind of progress? So workers are hurting. That's a message we hear a lot. There's a lot of proposals out there, and I think they sort of divide on two lines. One group of people sort of says, let's double down on kids. Let's really make children secure. Let's focus on their lives. And the, other group of people says, you know, no, let's go all in on work. And I think, you know, I won't make a prediction on which one, but it, I can imagine either being the top value. Mm -hmm. I think that's right. And I would say I think they're um, they're so complementary, right? Like, it's not, I mean, I know you agree, but it's not like there's a choice between those two things. Like, we would say we need both of those things. We need to help people with, who are struggling with the costs of raising children, because that's really expensive. We also need to reward work and make sure that that works. Um, and I think there are even other proposals out there on the table um, that go beyond that. Um, Representative Rashida Tlaib has um, announced one last week um, that goes beyond work. It's similar to this cost of living refund mm -hmm. in a bunch of ways. Um, but it also says the very poorest people deserve some help. No one should go hungry in America, whether they're working or not. We're the richest country in the world, and we ought to just say everyone has a right to the basics. And so it takes away that work requirement for the very lowest and uh, people at the very lowest end of the income spectrum. And, uh, and that's exciting, too. I think we're seeing what we're seeing broadly is um, I think many political leaders, both in Congress and in the presidential race, saying we need some kind of income support policy. Cash gives people freedom, agency, dignity, the tools to improve their own lives. And I think we will see get to a place where, um, you know, in the way that five years ago, $15 an hour was kind of a crazy outlandish idea, but now it's widely accepted as a pretty good idea by a lot of people in the political center. Um, I think we're going to see uh, modernized EITC and these cash programs more broadly kind of get to the same place, in part because they are both uh, they are both bold and reasonable at the same time. Like this is a really ambitious proposal, as Aparna has pointed out, it would expand benefits by two and a half trillion dollars over ten years. That is really big, and at the same time, we're building on the EITC, which I'll admit I'm embarrassed to say in a room full of EITC policy people. But at the when we first thought of this idea, or somebody suggested just we're like, ah, oh, the EITC is so boring. Like, <laughs> but it's really powerful. Um, and, yeah. But it's very reasonable. It makes 70% of voters nod their heads and say, yeah, that seems like a pretty reasonable idea. Yeah, I mean, uh, I hope the EITC is something that's on the, you know, the platform of a lot of these uh, candidates. Um, surprisingly for me, uh, it wasn't part of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. I mean, I thought there was sort of bipartisan approval for or bipartisan support for an EITC expansion and, and should have made it into the tax bill. Instead, we got a child, and ta a child tax credit expansion, which is interesting. Um, uh, so uh, I, I think if you look at uh, you know, the, sort of the Republican side, what we're seeing more in terms of child policy is sort of paid family and medical leave bills, which to me is you know, fascinating that we actually have Republicans talking about paid family and medical leave. Um, uh, but, but, but I can imagine sort of, you know, a pro-child, pro-family policy, 
that includes some combination of the child tax credit, maybe the child independent care credit, you know, making that refundable, uh, and something like paid family and medical leave being on the policy platforms, or, you know, on the right. Yeah, I'm optimistic that something will make it to the, some, anything at this point will make it to the platform. <laughs> you know, honestly, um, we'll make it to the platform that will provide the actual cash resources that families mm -hmm. need. So whether or not that's expanded um, earned income tax credit, whether or not that's a UBI, whether or not that's a baby bond, at this point, we've got to figure something else out because the situation is getting much more dire. Uh, for a population that is feeling more and more abandoned by the moment. And so our families are telling us continuously what they need. They are showing up and showing out, and it is time for us to finally let the policy reach them where they are. So I am optimistic. Mm -hmm. I mean, I hope, you know, <laughs> I, I, I am with you. Um, and just because we have time for one more thing, um, I did want to ask um, just a little bit more of a, like a broad cultural question around this, which is, you know, a long time, for a long time in America, the whole idea, you know, the American dream cliche is work hard and you will be fine. And we're kind of seeing that break down. So do you see the momentum that's kind of generating around this idea of, you know, meeting people where they are and actually lending a helping hand instead of leaving it up to the individual? Like, do you think that this is precipitating somewhat of a cultural shift in the country? And that can be for anyone. <laughs> so I don't see that changing. I think yeah. you know, if you if you ask people on the left, yeah, you know, the, when you look at the inequality or the mobility numbers, they say, well, that means we need to be doing a lot more through the government. Mm -hmm. When you ask people on the right, you know, to them, it's oh, we need to be enabling people to do more for themselves, you know, and that's the way to rise up. And yes, you know, welfare can only go so far. But we really need that attachment to work. So I think you know it's intensifying that debate, but along predictable lines on both sides, mm -hmm. which I think is good because you need a mix. You need a mix. You, you know, you need a combination of we need government supports for people who are not able to to do it for themselves, but at the same time we need to provide all the resources that you know people need in order to rise up. So I think you, you, it's good to see candidates sort of coalescing or even strengthening their own uh, perspectives. But, but this debate on mobility is certainly driving you know, a lot of that conversation and, I, and you know, making people sort of think, well, what could we be doing better? And I think that's where we want to be as a country. I'm going to disagree a little, because I think we're seeing something a little different out there. We're seeing um, the, the first place where we sort of heard this idea have some interest about the idea of expanding the definition yeah. of work to caregivers and students was in a focus group we did in the Detroit suburbs with uh, Republican-leaning independent women who were skeptical of a lot of the ideas we were throwing out there. Mm -hmm. um, and then we said, what about if you're home with a young child or a sick parent, you were getting this kind of help from the government, d would that be good? And there was this moment of silence where they all go, yeah, that would have been so valuable when I was home so with my children. people are very different from politicians. <laughs> I know, but then we dug, and, and, we dug yeah, deeper. You're right. You're right. And yeah. we saw in polling that the idea of expanding the definition of work to yeah. family caregivers and low-income students is supported two to one by Republicans, mm -hmm. three to one by independents, five to one by Democrats. And when I talk to people on the Hill, they go, well, if you're weakening the tie to work, we're going to lose all of the support for this policy. But that's not where voters are. So you're right. People yeah. are different from yeah. politicians, I think the people but are even, out further right. ahead I mean, Republicans right are changing. I mean, even with the paid leave, you know, as I see, there, there's this recognition that, yes, you know, there's, we're leaving out big chunks of the population. Mm -hmm. And whether we think of this as a pro-work policy or a pro-family policy, like, these are things that we need to care about. So that conversation is definitely changing. Yeah. Um, I agree with you. We've seen sort of historically the idea that the, the EITC has been had bipartisan mm -hmm. support. And I've worried at some times that the Republican side of that bipartisan support is getting quieter and quieter, yeah. and fewer and fewer people who are standing in, you yeah. know, in that yeah. circle speaking up. Um, but there was something really exciting for me, um, because this policy is moving at the state level in many states as well as at the federal mm -hmm. level, just as about half, a little more than half the states have EITCs. You can expand those to look like a cost of living refund. And there are several states that have been moving forward towards doing that this year in Washington State, Illinois, 
Maine and California are all places that have had that conversation. It's in the middle of it in California where Gavin Newsom has proposed a cost of living refund as part of his budget. And in the last 24 hours, the budget deal has been negotiated and includes um, closing corporate tax loopholes to pay for the modernized EITC. And the same is happening in Maine where it's coming down to the wire and it's passing, it's moving forward in Maine with bipartisan support. Um, last week, the um, taxation committee passed with unanimous bipartisan support, um, including leadership in both the um, Democratic and Republican sides, um, uh, a bill to modernize the EITC. And it's looking like that's going to move forward. So seeing Republicans actually speaking up yeah. for their bipartisan policy <laughs> makes me feel more optimistic about the prospects here. So when Belle Sahil did her research for her most recent book, she went and talked to people in different places, and they basically said, I don't want to be on just transfer mm -hmm. benefits. I want to work. I want to be productive. And I can imagine that definition of work expanding, as Adam's yeah. talking about, that we could call more things work, mm -hmm. but I really cannot imagine that our safety net will break entirely from this notion that work is important and valuable. Mm -hmm. Um, does anybody else have anything to add or should we turn it over to the audience? I'm sure there are a lot of questions. I think let's do that. Um, all right. Just in the front, I saw you first. Oh, in the, yeah. Right there in the jacket. Yeah, thank you. Good morning. Thank you very much. Um, you know, it's expensive to be poor and I feel like there isn't enough put out there about the fact that the poorer you are, the more likely you are to pay more for food mm -hmm. and for lodging. And there seems to be an idea out there that, um, that rich people pay more. They pay less for milk than the average person does in rural America or in tough parts of cities. Uh, in the 70s, when inflation was up, rapidly growing up, uh, the networks would do a f um, grocery stores. And they'd have people go into the grocery store and every week they would buy the same thing and then you would see how much the price has gone up. And I wonder if as part of the marketing for these proposals, you need to do more of saying, Freddie, um, in Baltimore in the center city, you pay more for milk than you do in Towson because you can go to Costco. So that's my question to you. Do you need to do more with the fact that being poor is expensive? So I think that framing is really interesting and also suggestive of we can't just buy our way out of this problem, right? There's some structural things that need to change as well. So part of it is certainly um, allowing, getting the information out that you're talking about. Like, what is it? Bank fees. Um, how do I get money? How do I go to the grocery <clears throat> store? All these things are very expensive and make your life more and more difficult. That's an important thing to point out to people and help them understand what the problem is. But I think it also um, points out that there's, you know, big sort of structural problems that are underlying this as well. And so we shouldn't think of just um, a little more cash as being the only answer. Great. Um, yeah, and the denim jacket. I love the ideas that uh, came up. These are great discussions. So my question is, um, besides money going to research to discuss on panels these conversations, what type of money and who is funding people to go out into the field and go out into these communities that do not have access to spaces like this and saying, do you know what the price of milk is? Do you know? How do you see your relationship with government? So what, who is funding those projects? Where is the money coming from to send people out to just get information to see how people without master's degrees and PhDs know every single detail, but don't know how to talk to real people. So I would like to know who is doing the project and where the money is coming from to start interviewing every single American to see how they view their relationship with government, how they want to get out of poverty, and how much that funding is. 
I, um, I'm really excited by, it's exactly the right question, I'm really excited by some of what we're seeing happening in that space, and it seems to me like it's just the tip of what needs to be a much larger iceberg. Um, I see Dorian Warren, who runs Community Change over there, and many of the groups he works with around the country have taken on um, this issue. These are kind of grassroots economic justice organizations. One America and Washington State, which is an immigrant rights advocacy organization. Ohio Organizing Collaborative that's doing door-to-door -door, um, canvassing in the Toledo area on this issue, and clergy meetings and house meetings. Um, and Mothering Justice in Michigan, uh, Maine People's Resource Center in Maine. So there are a bunch of groups that are starting to do organizing around this, and it's just the beginning, and it's not enough yet, because ultimately for this to happen at the big level, it's gonna have to be much more. Um, I've seen some funders in this room, like the Joyce Foundation, who are funding that kind of organizing, um, but not enough yet. idea, right, is based on many different fields of study. No, talk to me after if you are tired of speaking amazing ideas in panels and you have no capital, you have no capital. You're up against the Koch brothers with billions of dollars and you have no capital. You're organizing with no money. So let's talk real money, put some real ideas into action. No, I'm sorry. So I would get to the that, next uh, question. I'm Can we get to the next question? Okay. So I think there are some really interesting demonstrations going on right now. I think there are some really interesting demonstrations going on, some of which your group is funding, others, um, Greg Duncan's doing that great work in. Um, with young moms, and yeah. I think these so sort of things. <coughs> yeah, so there's, many foundations it's, yeah, it's a lot of involved in actual this, sort of projects yeah. around the country. Right. I think probably every foundation yeah. that's in here has um, thrown has some money into one of these demonstrations. And, which and there's a lot of grassroots organizing going on around all these issues. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, great. Yeah, in the second to last section, right there. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming, and I really appreciate hearing all of you speak. Elaine, I've, I've read a little bit of, of what you've written online, so maybe you can speak to this about the intersection between SNAP and the EITC. Mm -hmm. So I understand that not everyone who's eligible for SNAP is eligible for the EITC or vice versa, and acknowledging uh, the strenuous process that is trying to apply for, the, for, for just one, I mean, I'm trying to imagine the struggles that someone has to go through to try to, to try to go through both. And I know that there have been these almost like common app proposals for different welfare programs to try to make it easier for folks who have enough barriers in their way to be able to just merely apply. Um, I'm mm -hmm. wondering if you could speak a little bit about the intersection between those programs. I know every single person in this room believes fundamentally that food is a cornerstone to one's well-being, nutrition in particular. The Trump administration declaring spray cheese a staple food of SNAP clearly is antithetical to this cause, and I, I wanna know what is being done and what else can be done to make it easier for folks who are literally starving um, to, to be able to, to get by. So when I think about the safety net, I think about um, Social Security, of course. I think about unemployment insurance for some people. But then the other two big pieces are SNAP and the EITC. And so we had some an opportunity to work with um, government data and state data where we looked at that intersection between some of these programs. And there's also great work being done at AEI on this. Um, what we found is that basically half of the people who receive SNAP benefits do not receive the EITC. Who are those people? They're typically people who are not working. Um, most of them are elderly. So that is how that works. And then interestingly enough, half of the people who re receive the EITC receive SNAP. Who are those people? The people who receive the EITC but not SNAP are people whose earnings are too high to qualify for SNAP benefits. So that's one of the real, um, issues around the safety net is that every program comes with its own rules about who's 
eligible. We don't even define the units the same. So my SNAP unit is the people I live with and share meals with. My tax unit is defined by legal relationships. So um, if I am living with my partner, we are not married, we are both um, parents of the children in this house, we would be one SNAP unit, we would be one unit per Section 8 housing. We are two tax units, mm -hmm. though, because there's no cohabiting filing status. Um, and so that's a real issue when you start piling on more and more programs. Who is eligible? How do we really count your resources? Um, you know, in the case of the tax system, we kind of leave out resources of, you know, these multi-generational households that are all coming together. But we also leave out needs. So sometimes people come into a household bringing money, and that's great, and it gets counted in some programs. And oftentimes people come into households with needs, and those needs, if they're not included in the unit, don't get counted. And so I think that maze of how these programs intersect is almost impossible to figure out. And then worse, we have a, built a system that really keeps them separate intentionally. So the way we legislate, um, legislators are very tied to the committees and they work through their committee. So if I'm on the education committee, I increase the Pell Grant. If I'm on the tax committee, I increase a tax credit. Um, and that's a huge issue because at the heart of this is an actual person who has to figure this out. And that's why I sort of started with thinking about this system we have now is just a Rube Goldberg machine. Like when it works, it can really work. We can provide childcare and housing and food and work supports, but it's so easy for the ball to fall off the coaster at any of these intersections and you get totally left out, even if you're eligible. And sometimes by design you get left out because you're not included in the unit that we deem the appropriate way to look at your resources. Um, yeah, all the way in the back, blue shirt. Um, I'm Carl Pulzer. Uh, I started a project called the Center on Capital and Social Equity. It, in essence, uh, advocates for including the low-wage people in the economy, and I'm a member of the National Academy on Social Insurance. So I'm glad to see this um, discussion going out to interactive effects and other programs. And I, I think there's a lot of distortions or changes in the labor market that the EITC, especially if it's expanded, um, may cause, and, and it's pr probably being overlooked because it's so popular. One is the impact on Social Security. And for low-income people, Social Security is probably the only, the imputed value of it is probably the only asset they have. Uh, to my understanding right now, for the money that is, give, is subsidized in their wages by the government, there, there's no Social Security benefit that's generated by that, there's no contribution. If we vastly expand that, you're cutting their benefits. So when they get disabled or when a family member dies or when they get old, they get less. And so I think if you're gonna spend $2 trillion, this is a question in the form of an answer. Um, if you're gonna spend uh, $2 trillion on Social Security, you gotta kick over another 200 million, I mean on EITC expansion, something has to give with Social Security. I, I don't know how, would, is that how it would work? So, so certainly your EITC wouldn't be added in your wage statement. That's right. But, but the amount of earnings you have are still what you had that's before. Right. So it's just supplementing more, right? Supplementing so I think at the argument rate. is if we did a massive wage support program, what would happen to wages? Would they um, fall? Is that? So to the extent that the employer can sort of suck up some of that benefit is the issue? Well, you know, no, well, I don't think There's that. an estimate that half the money goes to the employer. So, I mean, I don't mean to talk too much, but the, I'm, with all apologies to Senator Brown, the, the same people he wants to penalize, you know, for having a lot of low-wage workers and paying them lousy, the EITC is giving them a wage subsidy. The, a lot of it goes to the employer in the, in the because the, you know, uh, encourages work and expands the, the labor market. Um, but the, the Social Security is just a technical thing. I mean, it's mm -hmm. like your, your final benefit depends on how much you put in. I if think you're not putting in as much, you're not getting it. And if, <clears throat> if your, your amount of labor doesn't generate that, you, it's breaking that tie. It just needs to be thought through. 
But I would imagine, if anything, it's going to push more people into the workforce okay. because you're, you're getting a benefit. larger yeah. supplement. So it shouldn't affect your actual wage base, which is being taxed for Social Security. But it will supplement it more so people have more income. And we've had other examples where yeah. there have been sort of, you know, floods into the labor market, you yeah. know, um, new labor, immigration, things like that. And we don't see... Um, yeah, if anything, these we need more downsides. people into the... Yeah. Right. So I think you'd in. also have to count about, think about all those people who have these new wages that are now going to be yeah. paying Social paying, Security paying taxes Social and Security. qualifying for Social Security benefits. There's definitely some things to think through, though. Mm -hmm. um, I think we have time for maybe one or two more. So, um, yeah, over there, second row. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you so much. Hi. Thank you so much. Um, I would love to hear all, like, your thoughts about messaging. Um, I really believe that people have such negative and biased and unreal views of the poor. Um, Aisha, I really, I really value what you have to say about the real lived experiences of people. And um, I feel like there's a real acceptance of a permanent underclass. And so I'm wondering how you think messaging can be used to move these really solid ideas forward, given the fact that so much of the opposition is really rooted in very deep-seated prejudice. I think, yeah, I think um, we've done a lot of opinion research to try to look at that and understand that. And I think one of the things that we find is there are important policy reasons that we've talked about to help people who are struggling at the sort of lower edge of the middle class trying to hang on, like the 40% of Americans and who can't afford the basics of a middle class lifestyle. But there are also, uh, from a messaging perspective or a political perspective, there's also value there. Because when you're reaching half of all Americans, people hear about this idea and they, they see it more through a lens of self-interest how is this going to help me? Is it going to help my kids, my neighbors, my sister? More people f see a stake in this, and that just changes the conversation for people. People spend less time worrying about how someone else is going to spend their money, mm -hmm. and more time thinking about how this is kind of lifting, you know, a rising tide that's lifting all boats. And I think that's part of why it's we see in our opinion research that it's quite popular. Um, but I also think that's why you see the people who are spending the most time in America thinking about public attitudes, the presidential candidates, like starting to one by one, you know, take their step in this direction. So my colleague Len Berman has a proposal out that's a universal EITC. He'd uh, match dollar for dollar the first ten thousand dollars of earnings and um, never phase it out. And one of the reasons for that is this messaging issue. So everybody gets it. Now everyone's going to pay for it too with a VAT. Um, but that sort of universal program, much like Social Security, can sometimes um, you know, make a program a little bit uh, more appealing or at least have a broader base of people willing to sort of fight for it. Right. Um, and I think the EITC is relatively easier to sell because it's, you know, it's also pro-work. I, th I view that very differently from, let's say, cash welfare, like TANF, right? I mean, people have very different views about the EITC and about TANF, and, and not just sort of people in, uh, in Congress, but really, you know, when you talk to, when you survey people, they're much more likely to want to claim the EITC because they think, well, this is, you know, I earned it, I worked for it, and I earned the EITC, but they don't want to go to a TANF office and actually just claim cash welfare because that, you know, that, that really, you know, that tells you that you're sort of, you don't have a job and you really need the money and that's why you're, you're claiming TANF. So I think it's relatively easier to message something like the EITC or an EITC reform because it, it just is appealing that, oh, it's pro-work and look at all the good research that shows that it helps families and, mm -hmm. you know, it helps families with children and the children go on to do much better. So I think yeah, it's just, it's just, it seems to me like it's an easier sell than, than something like you know, welfare. Mm -hmm. uh, we have time for one more as long as it's super quick right there in the front. Thanks. Uh, Evan Preston from US Perg. A question for Aisha, because I was struck by what you said about the great difference between whose care work is recognized and has been celebrated historically in the United States 
and the potentially, I think, radical possibility for valuing and recognizing everyone who is doing caregiving through this kind of expansion of the EITC. And so I just love to hear, given your organizing in Mississippi and uh, the potential for that to change the conversation, and would love to hear a partner's reaction too, given the connections with uh, paid family medical leave, but mm -hmm. especially Asia. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, thank you for that. Um, and so you're exactly, exactly right. What we are seeing um, with the possibility of expanding the earned income tax credit and really, you know, redefining how we look at work, that would be um, beyond empowering for the women that we work with because they are mothers who are home taking care of their kids and who are, are having to make that decision um, because in a lot of instances, the workforce is not set up in a way for where you can actually afford to do both. Mm -hmm. And so recognizing that and honoring that and giving voice to that um, would be awesome. And what we're seeing, you know, with the work that we're already doing around the cash um, transfer program that we're doing and around the community organizing is that women are doing both and. They are working in the home and they're working outside the home and they are just making it happen. And so to have the resources where everything didn't have to be a struggle so much and you could actually have some of your bandwidth freed up to actually have a ma I was in a meeting the other day and somebody's talking, talking about imagination. I'm like, who really gets to have an imagination? I'm sorry, I digress. But that, you know, they have the bandwidth where you're freed up, where you can show up and have imagination and not only dream about a future, but have the resource needed to actually actualize that future. It's what, you know, all of this, when we really are imagining what's possible, what all of this will look like. Yeah, great. I mean, and I, I'm really happy to see the conversation around caregiving change, yep. changing so much across the country. You know, it's good to see the caregiving be a sort of separate component in the, in the CLR. Uh, but we absolutely need to, you know, when I think of caregiving and how do we address paid family and medical leave issues, I think of it as maintaining that attachment to the workforce. I think what the CLR is saying is that even if you're not attached to the workforce, you would get some, you know, you should be compensated because mm -hmm. obviously it's, you know, it's unpaid work, but it's work. Um, uh, but what we are trying to do is say, well, how do we make it possible that people are actually able to take that time off? You know, most people don't need to spend sort of five years out of the workforce when, when they have kids. A lot of, a lot of us uh, you know, and a lot of people, even low-income people, would frankly, you know, want to do actually end up going back to work within four to six weeks. So how do we make it possible for them to even take that much time off? And I think, you know, having a paid leave policy that gives you some fraction of your wages when you were working uh, would let you do that. So it maintains that attachment to the workforce. You go back after, you know, two months or three months, uh, but, but you have the ability to stay home when you need to. So I think it's good to, you know, sort of address caregiving directly as an economic issue, as an economic challenge that the country is facing, and not just, oh, this is a women's issue, and you know, mm -hmm. how do we how do we deal with this? But it's really, you know, 50% of the workforce or more is, is women, and how do we make sure we keep them attached to the workforce? How do we make sure that they are able to work if they want to, yeah. because that helps them provide for the families as well. So I think it's a it's a huge sort of economic goal for us to achieve. We have to, I'm sorry, we, we have to wrap up, unfortunately, I'm sorry. We're, we're getting on the stage. <laughs> Thank you so much for all of your questions, everyone, and for all of our panelists. It was really wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, Thanks. Thanks. So I'm Dorian Warren. I'm co-chair of the Economic Security Project and president of Community Change. We did a little switcheroo on you this morning. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Representative Gwen Moore. And let me just say a few words about her. She, like me, is from the Midwest, the great state of Wisconsin, born in Racine, grew up in Milwaukee. And she's been serving in the House of Representatives since 2005. At one point, she was Democratic co-chair of the Congressional Women's Caucus. She has been a tireless, tireless advocate 
for a range of policies to support low-income families and communities of color. She led an effort to curb predatory lending. She has supported efforts for small businesses and especially minority-owned businesses. She especially has focused on low-income students. And as a former um, participant in the TRIO program, like myself, has been a tireless champion for TRIO programs for low-income students to attend college. I could go on and on and on, but you want to hear from her. So um, let me just say this. It's one thing to come up with really original, great ideas to solve the big problems in our society. It's another thing to fight for them. Representative Moore does both. She is an original thinker. She comes up with big ideas, and she is one of our few champions in Congress who actually fights for them. So with that, please join me in welcoming Representative Gwen Moore. Oh my God, I'm so regretting every single moment that I missed of this amazing conference. And let me just thank the Urban Institute for organizing uh, this conversation, uh, which has to be had. I've, as historian has indicated, I've served in the House of Representatives since 2005, served on the Financial Services Committee until this year, when finally, after 14 years, I won a seat on the Ways and Means Committee where I have an opportunity to lean into everything. <laughs> and I do think that Elaine made a really important point, that sometimes we compartmentalize these conversations uh, to talk about the needs of low-income students, and we are on the Labor H Committee or the Labor Appropriations Committee, so we focus on that, TRIO programs, and then we are on the Energy and Commerce Committee, so we're concerned about Medicaid expansion for pregnant women. And, uh, but uh, in the Ways and Means Committee, I get to talk about everything. Uh, and I wanted to be on the Ways and Means Committee um, of, before I even got to, to, to Congress, but seniority and all the other things that go on there prevented me from moving up there. But you know, timing is everything. Uh, what Drake say started from the bottom, now I'm here. <laughs> um, I, I can tell you that this is very personal to me. Uh, I was a young, struggling mother. I gave birth to my first child at age 18. So I'm a great-grandmother now. And she says, Mom, you're a great-grandmother because you had a baby young, not because I had children who were too young uh, to have children. But I was a single mom. I was a student. Um, and... Uh, Really, uh, I have thought a lot about uh, these conversations because of my own experience. Really, having the welfare department deem, and we talked about this, deem my tuition grant money and book money as income for the purposes of, of determining whether or not I was eligible for welfare. And I think the panel talked about that a little bit. How are you going to treat income uh, in order to achieve certain equities. Uh, so I've thought a lot about this. I've also been a victim of the welfare queen trope, which I proudly uh, acknowledge now that I am definitely a queen and a welfare queen. <laughs> One of the most, uh, uh, I have been a real critic of welfare, uh, Temporary Assistance to Needy Families Act, um, and welfare policy because it really, there's, the narrative goes something like this. Oh, we're going to help lift you out of poverty and we're going to connect you to work and, uh, you know, and, and there's a dignity in working. I know that's Sherrod Brown's theme and I don't disagree with it. But, you know, you don't have policies that really put people on that trajectory of climbing out of poverty. But the earned income tax credit, 40 years old, uh, you know, uh, uh, really signed into law by Richard Nixon. Got to say something good about him. Uh, Gerald Ford, sorry. Uh, that is a program that really has some legs, in my opinion, for really continuing to address the, uh, the wage supplementation that we've got to do for, for the private sector. Private sector really is leading the charge against a, a rising minimum wage. And the wage stagnation is really, really, really having profound impact on families. 
but the earned income tax credit, as inadequate as it is today, boosts the income of about 28 million Americans and lifts 9 million uh, uh, people out of poverty and above the poverty level uh, every year. So it is an effective way to incentivize work and to reward work. And of course, it's 40 years old, uh, which means a revamp is long overdue. Uh, and so timing is everything. I'm here now. <laughs> First person of my type on the Ways and Means Committee. Um, I've been working really closely with the Economic Security Project to develop legislation that would increase and simplify the EITC for workers. It would expand eligibility for the Earned Income Tax Credit to include caregivers and students and make other critical improvements to the EITC. Uh, in the next few days, I'm going to be introducing the Worker Relief and Credit Reform Act, or the Worker Act. You've got to always think of something cute. And let's start with the simplification piece of it. It would decouple the EITC from the number of children a taxpayer has by tying the credit available to the numbers of workers in the family or whether the taxpayer is single or married. Uh, it, would, it would retain, of course, the <clears throat> provision uh, that we're now going to provide uh, benefits to childless adults, uh, but would lower that age to age 18 from 25. Uh, we think that this will reduce a lot of the errors that are found in the EITC. Uh, and there's more complexity that we will continue to work on um, uh, to, to simplify this, and I won't bore you with those details. But we are, uh, 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 we, we are also rate, uh, uh, removing the upper uh, age limit of 65. Uh, I'm over 65 and I'm still working. Uh, and for low income seniors who are continuing to work either because they want to work or unfortunately because they have to work, they deserve the same support as other workers. Uh, we're removing that barrier to seniors working. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and uh, we're also going to improve it by increasing the amount of the credit available. The maximum credit for single filers would be 4,000 and 8,000 for married filers. Uh, in 2018, for a single person with no qualifying children, they received a mere $519, uh, earning a minimum wage of $15,270 a year. Uh, in contrast, the Worker Act would provide uh, a benefit to single workers without children at home. The average benefit for recipients is $3,400 to $3,600 for workers earning below $40,000 a year. It also features a 100% phase in. And by phasing it in much faster, very poor workers receive more help on their first dollars of, of earnings. Uh, and it would also increase the phase out amount for the credit. Uh, to provide more help to middle class workers uh, further up the income spectrum. Um, I, I had an amazing uh, <clears throat> meeting last night uh, uh, on the Ways and Means a dinner, and our guest speaker uh, really walked through the economic progress in the United States. We have plenty of money to respond to something I heard earlier. Having money is not a problem. Problem is, is that, you know, you hear all the time our president talk about the great GNP uh, that we have uh, and the stock market rising. We are not lacking in resource and money. The, the problem is, is that during, <clears throat> during the period between the world wars, uh, about 53% of our growth our GNP was going to workers and their families or being reinvested in the companies. And 47% of that was going to the shareholders. And since 2003, all of the, the, the growth in our GNP, 84% of that growth has gone to the top 1%. So when you hear people talk about the 99% and the 1%, it's really true. So wh what's growth? Uh, you know, uh, it doesn't matter how big our, our GNP is, 
if I get 84% of it uh, uh, all to, to myself. And so this is the problem we're trying to respond to. We're trying to supplement those wages. Um, I got a little bit off my, off my beautiful notes that my um, wonderful team prepared for me. So forgive me uh, for that. I wanna talk specifically uh, about a couple of the improvements that I wanna make uh, in it. First thing I wanna do is I want to recognize the work of caretakers. Um, and this is a lot more complicated than, um, than we thought it would be. And I think Elaine uh, from the Urban Brookings Tax Center Policy, if I'm not mistaken, was leading into this as I was coming through the door uh, to talk about how we actually look at income. What happens when you are uh, on Social Security, maybe have a small pension or more increasingly uh, is the case you don't have a pension, but you have Social Security income and you're living at home and the only thing that will prevent you from going to a nursing home is if you, if someone in your family moves in with you to take care of you or comes by at least to get you some breakfast and help you get to bed and whip up some tuna fish for you or something that you could pop in the microwave. Uh, and it takes them out of the workforce part time or solely in order to keep you out of a nursing home. I mean, I, this is personal. All of us are experiencing this right now. But if their work is not recognized, um, you might find yourself uh, uh, in a nursing home. So uh, our current tax law, you know, would require that you pay half of their income, that you, uh, 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 that you, you qualify in other ways. So we need to look at um, how we can reward the work of caretakers who are truly keeping people at home and but for their labor uh, would not be able to stay home and to provide them with the earned income tax credit provision. So that's one provision that I have in my bill. Another is the student benefit. Democrats and Republicans alike have fierce arguments over uh, educational opportunity. But one thing that everybody is on the same page with is that here in the 21st century that nobody can really, uh-oh, I got, I got a, how many seconds or minutes? Huh? Five seconds? Oh, five minutes. Five minutes, I'm gonna be done in, in, in less than five minutes, okay. We, we've all decided that you gotta have some education beyond high school in order to succeed in this economy. And yet, we don't have any way to uh, help people articulate between their situation of poverty and going to school. We've heard about the $1.5 trillion worth of student debt and other initiatives. How do we help people get the education and training? Well, my Worker Act um, would provide people um, with the opportunity to go to school uh, based on uh, their income or whether or not their parents qualify as low income students, whether they qualify uh, for the Pell Grant or other indicators that indicate their uh, ability <clears throat> to be qualified for the earned income tax credit. Um, we have other provisions uh, that will enable, I'm very excited about being able to provide people with the accelerated uh, earned income tax credit where they could get the, they could uh, elect the advanced payment option. I know that this has been a really scary uh, provision that we've tried before, um, but we think that we can provide the IRS with resources uh, uh, with an online portal where people can sign up for the advanced payments. They can estimate the advanced payment amount track payments dispersed in the remaining balance and report their changes in circumstances and turn off and pay back advanced EITC. Uh, we're thinking that if we gave them 75% of the credit that they were due, that that would prevent overpayments or um, ameliorate the chances that they would be advanced 
uh, too much. Um, but that being said, we think that uh, this is a common sense here. We do a few things. We really expand the earned income tax credit to include more low-wage workers. Uh, we're talking about people who earn up to perhaps $40,000 a year so that we bring more people uh, under the umbrella uh, of economic safety. We're talking about expanding it to students so that people really can uh, lean into being uh, uh, entrepreneurs and, and, and be educated to take on the new uh, kinds of jobs that are created in our economy. We're talking about recognizing the work of people who, but for uh, the earned income tax credit, would uh, suffer immeasurable harm by leaning into helping take care of loved ones uh, at home. And seniors, people who, but for the labor of the loved ones, would find themselves in nursing home without some economic uh, uh, buoyance from this initiative. Um, and so for so many individuals and families across the country with jobs, and even those who work full time, uh, economic st stability just seems out of, out of reach. Um, but uh, Dr. King said uh, that the only solution to poverty, the only solution to poverty out of all the ideas we come up with is to abolish it directly. So let's get busy, y'all. So am I on the hot seat now for questions? Yeah, let's go for it. Let's do it. Wow. Okay. Oh, uh, thank you for her question. She um, she was really pleased if you didn't hear her that I talked about uh, the importance of of you know uh, uh, trying to look at cross uh, cutting uh, benefits uh, and how you address them and 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 what I plan to do. And I do think you know I do think that our under our current law, as an example. Uh, it seems almost as if you have to cohabit with a person that you're caretaking for in order to receive the benefit. Um, because you got to prove that you uh, provide 50% of their support. But what if they're at home and receiving Social Security benefit and their Social Security benefit is actually paying their their living expenses, some of it. They say they live in a home that's already paid for. Uh, and um, uh, the only thing they have to pay is taxes. Uh, and here you are, you're the member of the family that you've all gotten together and says, look, mom is at home. She can't stay home by herself. You, um, Mary, are earning $18,000 a year at the, uh, at the restaurant, and you're the only one that's in position to move in with mom to take care of her. Um, so, um, or, or, you know, maybe you live, Mary, you live with your boyfriend, but somebody's got to take care of mom. Does Mary then have to leave her boyfriend or whatever and move in with mom if mom only needs, you know, um, you know, you know, five hours a day of help until somebody else can come and relieve her? But that five hours would prevent her from going to her restaurant job. And so these are things we want to sort out. We don't want it to be a benefit that no one will be able to take because I am now, you know, LeBron James sending money home to mom um, uh, so that she can stay in her home. 
uh, and, and, and I can call her my dependent. And so therefore I'd be eligible for what? Not the earned income tax credit. So we want to make this real. And so we're going to continue to work on these provisions sort of to flatten out the requirements and look, it's this, this, we haven't done this for 40 years. So to look at the tax code and to figure out how to discount certain income in terms of determining whether or not uh, uh, that caretaking person would be eligible to claim them as a dependent, especially if they're keeping them out of a nursing home uh, in order to provide that care. And that's, a, you know, like at age 68, that's real appealing to me. <laughs> and also, I'm also excited about the students, uh, about uh, phasing it in. You said, what am I excited about? That was a problem I addressed with the caretakers, but I'm excited about phasing in students. So we have students living in the cars um, and, and being hungry. Um, and uh, these are, this is our brain trust, uh, and we need to protect it by uh, giving them at least a minimum safety net. Well, you know, I, I think it's really important to disabuse ourselves of the notion that we don't have any money. Uh, and so, oh, what are the pay fors? We just gave $1.4 trillion and added to the debt some more, couple trillion dollars in, in the next decade. Um, and, you know, what we've been told is that the $1.4 trillion that we pass will pay for itself. Well, you know, math wasn't my best subject, but. We all know better. You know, we can make the argument. Like the earned income tax credit really creates this productivity. Anyone who's eligible for the earned income tax credit is not going to be buying back shares of stock. They're going to be going to, to Harris Teeter. Um, they're going to be going to Payless Shoes. Are they still open? Um, they're, they're, they're going to be spending this money and plowing it back into the economy. I mean, one of the things that's really important for people to understand, we don't have to be shy about this. 70% of our economy is about consuming. You know, if I'm the only person who can afford to buy a pair of shoes, um, God help the shoe manufacturers. You know, Henry Ford started out paying people five bucks an hour. Uh, because he realized that if you gave people five dollars an hour, which was a lot of money, if you gave them five dollars an hour, they would be able to afford a Model T. And and we have got to. That's how we can push this message out. That this is the closest thing to tax policy that that can pay off uh, and actually boost the income of our entire economy. So I just want to thank you all for having me, and uh, let's get to work. Okay, I just want to wrap up uh, today's program with, uh, with a few thank yous. Um, thanks, of course, to Senator Brown and Congresswoman Moore for their ideas their inspiration and their support for policies to make America a more equitable country. Thanks also to the panelists who shared their knowledge, experiences, and ideas. I really think you all helped advance the conversation on this important topic of using tax policy and other policies to help address poverty. I also want to thank the Economic Security Project for all their collaboration and efforts to make today's program a success and to help develop uh, actual legislative proposals in this area. And finally, a big thanks to the teams at Tax Policy Center and Urban Institute to organize today's program, to handle all the logistics, to run the microphones around. I uh, really appreciate all that. And thanks to all of you for your attention, both the folks in the audience and the folks online. Um, so give yourselves a round of applause, and let's call it a day.